Greetings, Guardians. My name is Bifear. So, Ghosts of the Deep as a story beat represents a really awesome moment in the story of the Lucent Hive in particular. It was actually an incredible gambit by Savathun's Brood because, I mean, you know, they literally crashed a ship into the Titan Oceans and then they went and found Oryx's remains and tried to resurrect him. On the face of it, that story's just awesome, and I love that, but if you look a little deeper into the nature of it, I think there's a real note of desperation here. Today we're going to pull a little on that thread and unravel the nature of the forces that took part in this operation to resurrect the Taken King, as well as looking at the Lucent Hive, where they are and where they might be after this operation. Note that a lot of what follows here is conjecture, but for the most part, given the circumstances, I think the conjecture itself is actually quite fair. Hopefully you'll agree with me, and if you don't, eh, comment section's right there. Wouldn't be the first time I've been wrong. If we're going to analyse all of this though, we should really start with the bigger picture, which is that the Lucent Hive are probably kind of weak right now. Let's keep in mind that their primary territorial control extends to Savathun's throne world, and that the Lucent Hive have only partial control over the throne world, with the continued Scorn presence there. Guardian operations in the throne world have probably also only continued to make the foothold they have even less stable. This has clearly limited their operational abilities, something which we'll be looking more into in a moment. Whilst the raw numbers of any hive brood can be a cause for concern though, what we've seen over the years is that they live and die by their leadership. The primary example that comes to mind for me of this is undoubtedly the brood of hive that resides on our moon. The Hellmouth on Luna has played host to Crota's brood of Hive, and ultimately they have seen multitudes of failures, multiple deaths of leaders, and this has left them in a sorry state. They've been on the back foot ever since the death of Crota, the son of Oryx, but this was only really the first blow to their power. Even when it seemed as though they were resurgent at the beginning of the Shadowkeep expansion, it turns out they were only really seeing a resurgence thanks to the manipulations of Savathun, who helped to concentrate their powers in a few leaders, namely the Four Daughters of Crota. And it's also worth noting that part of the resurgence in their power, and part of the greater power of darkness around the moon, comes from the resurgence of the Lunar Pyramid, not from the Hive themselves. Even when it seemed as though they might be able to crawl back into some kind of standing, yet again we came along and dispatched with many of their leaders. We personally killed Besserith in our recovery of the Cryptolith and Hashladun in the Scarlet Keep Strike, and the other two daughters, lesser known, are Kinox and Voshir, but they died at Osiris's hands just before he lost Sagira. The Hive broods on the moon at that point began to fall into total disarray, and effectively folded. When this did happen though, some of the Hive brood began to leave for other broods, and as this did happen, eventually, the forces began to splinter until they were folded into the greater forces of the Hive God of War, Zevo Arath. This is the point at which they started to become resurgent, because they had a leader. A leader who wasn't just going to die off because of a few Guardian strike teams, and more importantly, a leader who had command and respect over the swarms. Command and respect that would lend them power. So yeah, for the Hive, leadership really matters. Cut off the head of the snake and it will fester. Only lesser champions will rise, and then they will command a lesser brood. So let's apply all of that logic to Savathun's brood. The Witch Queen herself is dead at our hands, and whilst this isn't a permanent case, because it's quite likely that Imaru, her ghost, may get a chance to resurrect her in the future, I think there is a significant note to be made about how many other Hive Guardians and elite members of the Lucent Brood have been slain, including Alakul the Lightblade and Savathun's right hand, Council Wizard. The ranking members amongst their leadership at this point probably aren't even Hive. The highest member is probably Imaru, Savathun's ghost. With that in mind, the leadership is still somewhat intact, but Imaru is not going to be an inspiring leader. Yes, it seems like he's pretty good at coordination and giving marching orders to the Lucent Hive, but make no mistake, the Witch Queen was most likely the real mastermind behind all of this, and with Savathun dead, the Lucent Hive are festering. They are in a bad way because they do not have the strong leadership that would guide them. 
With their leadership damaged, they're in a bad enough state as is, but it's also worth remembering that we don't have much information about how strong their fleet assets are. It's something that often doesn't get talked about in Destiny's lore, but there are multiple entries talking about how Zivu Arath has massive fleets of Hive ships that go on and engage Keitel's forces in different avenues and in different places, and how she's mustering her armies within the Ascendant Plane ready for an assault on Sol itself. This implies that Zivu's forces are rather broad, not just in terms of her raw foot power, but also with the actual capital ships to support and move those troops. And as for Savathun's forces, well, the same can't necessarily be said, it's really not clear. Savathun's own ship, the Lure, is still hanging in orbit above Mars near the Relic, and we don't know, other than that, how extensive Savathun's fleet assets are. So. It's likely that either she's holding them back in reserve, or that was her last order, or there just aren't that many of them. Now, it's entirely possible for a hive god of trickery to not show their full hand, but I think with that leadership collapsed, more of those ships would actually be put to use. And so here, I think it leaves us with a series of questions about Savathun's fleet assets. And we do know this as a simple thing. No hive worth their salt would sacrifice an entire ship by crashing it into Titan without good reason. So, if Savathun is lacking ships, it speaks to the desperation of that particular move. If the Hive of the Lucent Brood lack leadership, as they do, that's our first clue about the nature of this operation. And if they were willing to sacrifice a Lucent Hive fleet ship in order to secure the future of this endeavor, that's our second clue. But our third clue about the nature of the Lucent Hive's gambit here comes from the little bit of dialogue we get at the start of the dungeon. And it's not something that's immediately said. You see, after they saw Titan reappear, suddenly this plan has come into action. Very quickly, mind you, given that this happened canonically in Destiny terms within the same week as Titan reappearing. There is a lot of activity within that time. And, well, at that point, they decided to drop an entire command vessel crashing down into Titan's seas. And so, yeah, they were going to get noticed. But even if they weren't, they disrupted everyone's comms. We eventually lose Sloan over the radio up until the point at which we actually finish the dungeon and end the ritual. Which means that if our comms are being dislodged, then yeah, they were going to present a really good reason for us to investigate regardless of whether we saw the ship, which... I mean, it's a massive ship. How are we not going to see this in the first place? So yeah, in this moment, the Lucent Hive aren't hiding their presence at all. In fact, they're creating so much disruption that they're actually attracting all of their enemies here. So, yeah, it really has to be worth it if they're going to do this. Because right now, and that's not something that should be taken lightly, because remember, this is a theatre of war that doesn't just involve us, it also involves Zivu Arath, who is very much not on the same side as Savathun and the Lucent Brood's remaining forces. This operation, just based on these ideas alone, screams desperation to me. And again, it's hard to understand exactly what's going through the mind of any one Hive commander at any point, and perhaps conjecture on their emotional state isn't exactly helpful. Any comment I make here might indeed be incorrect, but I think sometimes the nature of the move speaks for itself. I mean, why bring back the Taken King in the first place? A strong Hive leader uses their brood like a tool to accomplish their aims. I can't imagine that this was one of Savathun's aims, because resurrecting her brother would have been creating an internal challenge to her own leadership. No, this speaks as the Lucent Hive looking for a new leader. And at that point, you've opened up the can of worms and really revealed this for what it is. Without a strong leader, the Hive suffer, and there are very few individuals who would have been as strong as Savathun. In fact, there are only three that are comparable. Herself, her sister Zivu Arath, and Oryx the Taken King. So yeah, when I look at all of this, it screams to me that the Lucent Hive here were making this desperate gambit because they had sub-commanders and they had some lesser leadership, but the leadership knew that in order to properly command the Brood, they needed a real leader. And with Savathun absent, they turned to the next best thing. 
Zivu Arath would never have agreed to allow Hive that have adopted the Light to join her ranks, and so they would attempt to resurrect Oryx because they needed a leader, desperately. Now, with that possibility in mind, because again, everything I am stating here is conjecture and speculative, but with that possibility in mind, let's go ahead and look at some of the individual Lucent Hive that can be found around the dungeon and see what we can learn from their presence within this operation. And this matters because we're able to see a few emerging groups amongst the Lucent Hive forces. Lucent Hive that I would remind everyone come from very specific backgrounds that needed to be here in order for this operation to take place in the first instance. Context here is really important. So let's start with the prime example of all of it. Ektar, the former Sword of Oryx turned Shield of Savathun, aka the first of the dungeon's bosses. Ektar was one of the top lieutenants of Oryx and he died on the Dreadnought. Being resurrected there means that of course, as a guardian, he doesn't have any knowledge of his previous life, but he's been resurrected probably on the Dreadnought in the place he died. And as a result, he has been surrounded by context of his previous life, as well as the power of the Hive God that he once served. It would not surprise me even slightly if Ektar was able to find records indicating what happened to Oryx, who he serves, and how powerful Oryx once was, before eventually returning and joining the Lucent Brood. On the other hand, we have Simuma Ur Nokru. We've seen this Hive Necromancer only briefly in the Strange Terrain Strike. We encountered them about midway through, just ahead of the massive Ogre Ritual Chamber. And once again, they would have been killed by us Guardians and then resurrected by a ghost. And if they were resurrected on Mars, they would have been given some reasonable amounts of context as to the nature of their past lives. This is important because previously, as her name implies, Simuma would have been one of Nokris's necromancers, someone who is gifted with the talent of bringing Dead Hive back to life. And that matters because not only is she then being resurrected into an environment on Mars where she's surrounded by potentially all of that old context, but also it would have been even easier to rehome that gift because the Lucent Hive themselves have some of Nokris's knowledge of necromancy and they got it from Nokris himself. Remember that at the beginning of the season of Arrivals, Nokris struck a bargain with Savathun. As a part of the bargain they struck, Savathun at the beginning of the season of Arrivals was taught by Nokris about the nature of necromancy. And so it's likely the case that even if Sumuma wasn't able to find any of the knowledge of necromancy after she was resurrected on Mars, she would have been able to find that knowledge when she looked around the records of the Lucent Brood themselves. So yeah, all of this stuff is just at the Lucent Hive's fingertips, and understanding necromancy and being a powerful wizard made her an ideal part of all this. And so you have these different groups of Hive being brought together, the two offshoots of Hive and the main Lucent Brood, I have to presume. You have this triad of different influences, and it only requires a little bit of deliberation for all of these perspectives to really conjoin on a single point, which is this. The Lucent Hive and Sumuma have the powers of necromancy because they preserved Nokris's knowledge. They have a necromancer who's been resurrected and has practiced their craft. And then you have the knowledge of Ekthar, who would have likely understood and found where Oryx's body fell, even if it shouldn't have crashed into Titan and it should have crashed into Saturn. Anyway, point being, moving on, yeah, they would have all converged on this one likely point to simply say this, if we have the ability to make a new leader, why aren't we doing that? So all of these different groups of Hive have been brought together by this purpose of resurrecting the Taken King, but it's clear that there was some deliberation required to even reach that point. The Lucent Hive that took part in this operation all come from distinct legacies of Hive, whether they were from Oryx's brood, Nokris's, or Savathun's core Lucent Hive. And so it really does feel like these fractured puzzle pieces coming together to allow this plan that, had we not interrupted it, would have been serendipitous. A plan that would have seen Oryx's resurrection and potential rulership over a new brood of Lucent Hive. 
This, of course, would have been one of the greatest powers in the entire system, and something that we would then need to contend with again. Also, it's worth remembering that this brood and their entire gambit seems very desperate for another reason, which is simply this. Oryx himself would not have liked this plan. At least in spirit, he was most definitely its biggest opponent, bigger even than us, bigger even than Zivor Rath. For the sake of the Lucent Brood members, including Ekthar and Samuma, who actually were going to resurrect Oryx, it's a really good thing that Guardians don't get resurrected with their past memories. Otherwise, I imagine Oryx would immediately kill all of them on the spot. And even then, what if he finds out the truth? So yeah, that's not going to be a pleasant moment when he barges through the door and basically demands to know why the hell they resurrected him against his expressed wishes. Yeah, not good. Not good for them. And keep in mind, at that point, he would be their hypothetical leader. So these Hive might just be risking their own lives if he ever remembers. Does this plan stink of desperation to me? Yes. Is that exactly what's happened? We don't know, because again, all of this is conjecture. But I think that there are a few small facts that we absolutely can keep in mind from all of this. The first few are simply that we are seeing Lucent Hive being resurrected from great battlegrounds across Sol. We saw clearly Ekthar, who would have been resurrected from the Dreadnought that hangs above Saturn. We saw Simuma, who would have been found somewhere on Mars. It wouldn't be too out of the question to see Titan and maybe Earth or even the Moon as areas where other Hive might get resurrected, if the timing and circumstances are correct. Also, we should note this. There is a third unknown party that perhaps represents Savathun's core forces and what remains of their leadership outside of Imaru, and they're noted at the very end of the dungeon. In the final boss arena, there are three separate antechambers with adherents that you need to kill. Anyone who's done the dungeon will know this. There's a wizard, who is the devoted of Simuma, and there is a titan, who is the devoted of Ekthar. But then there's a third adherent, an acolyte, and they're dedicated to a character that has not appeared in Destiny's lore thus far, a character known as Morak. Morak is the unknown in the dungeon. And perhaps it's more important here than we realize, because if the Lucent Hive do re-enter the story at any point, maybe they represent the last little bit of leadership that the Lucent Hive have, at least until some point at which the Witch Queen might get resurrected. Ekthar and Simamu seem like offshoots representing the knowledge of some disparate broods that have recently been folded into the Lucent Hive. You could also classify the same with Vorlock, the main Hive Knight, at the center of the room, given that he was originally also a member of the Court of Oryx and is continuously being resurrected by one of the necromancers of Nocris. This is someone who's also clearly been folded in. Morak has no references anywhere in the lore to them. We've never heard of this Hive before. And so likely it's the case that they have influence and leadership in some other position, and if we do hear that name in the future, it's worth remembering, because they're likely going to be important. By the way, hopefully this was an insightful look into the potential goings-on of the Hive of the Lucent Brood, and maybe you understand the context of the Ghosts of the Deep Dungeon just a little bit better. And, well, hey, it is all conjecture, but if it was a desperate gambit in the face of terrible odds, that's great storytelling. There's motive that can sometimes be gleaned from the things we see in Destiny. And when you do actually see all of that, and it does turn out to be the case that, yeah, this is what it is, that makes it even better, because it shows very physically the actual domino is being toppled, the manifestations of the choices these characters have been forced to make because of the things that we've done. I imagine that in a alternate reality where Savathun had not been killed in the Witch Queen, we would actually be in a place where Ghosts of the Deep would never have happened. And that, in itself, is a really interesting thing to think about. Not just by killing Oryx, but also by murdering Savathun. We kind of made this happen. Anyway, all those other thoughts and whatnot, yeah, leave them down below in the comments section. Let me know what you think. Do you believe this was a desperate gambit of the Lucent Brood? Do you reckon that they're still actually a powerful force within the system? 
What do you reckon? Also, if you enjoyed the video, go ahead and leave a like, and if you want more Destiny content, go ahead and hit subscribe and the bell next to subscribe to turn on those email notifications. But as per usual, know that your viewership, as always, is quite enough for me, and that in the meantime, my name has been My Name is Bife. Perodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside.